Welcome back to another episode of Focus on K-12, EdTech and the Education Experience. I'm your host, Doug Conopelko, Education Strategist and National Esports Manager at CDWG. Today, I talk with Ashley Cowger, the Executive Director of Strategy and Integration for Indianapolis Public Schools. We talk about education as a civil right, digital equity, and so much more. Let's dive in. My name is Ashley Cowger, and my title is Executive Director of Strategy and Integration for Indianapolis Public Schools. I've been working in education for the last 16 years in the nonprofit sector, um, education, public policy, and for the last about seven years have worked in district leadership in Indianapolis Public Schools. Interesting. So you've got a little bit of a different experiences under your belt, right? So um, what are, where are you focusing your efforts you know, what's your, your soapbox with your work these days in Indianapolis? I mean, the largest one, I think, thanks to our friend COVID, is really figuring out how we're enabling digital environments for kids so that learning can be continuous in any way in which we're doing learning in school, out of school. One of the things that we've been really pressed by in the education environment in the last year and a half, almost two years, is making sure that we're affording civil rights to students in the midst of a pandemic. And some of that has really come from bridging the digital divide that has existed in many school districts around the country. And some of what we're really what we're really struggling with um, across the country, but then also working to problem solve and providing transformation along the way is how the digital environment is making sure that we are affording just basic rights to students, rights to information, rights to high quality curriculum, rights to um, tools that they need to complete school, whether that's in-person, remote, hybrid, all of the contexts that we're seeing play out around the country. Absolutely. So how does equity then play a part in that? I think one of the things that, um, again, we've kind of been thrown into the deep end of the swimming pool, (laughs) meaning school districts, is um, equity really in terms of the digital technology and access to learning outside of a physical school building has largely been um, the context of who's had and who has not for many years in terms of basic resources. So the schools that are in affluent affluent communities or have great tax income have not necessarily been the schools that have struggled with the digital divide in the last 10, 20, 30 years. Then districts that have not had the same access to resources, largely school districts that are high poverty, high minority, high and differential ethnicities across the school district has had this struggle in access to technology. So when a pandemic hits and now we're trying to figure out how do we do school because we see no end in sight, the equity problem that we really end up, ended up seeing was a digital equity problem because we don't have devices, because we don't have electronic curriculum, because we don't have, and all of that backtracks to basic resourcing of school districts, the way that taxes have been allocated in communities, the way that referendums have passed or not over time. So for us, the equity issue really ended up coming down to a digital equity problem. And unfortunately, that digital equity problem was staring in the face of large urban school districts around the country. For folks who don't know, maybe tell us a little bit about the makeup of Indianapolis Public Schools for context. Yep, we are the largest urban school district in the state of Indiana. We serve about 27,000 students and our student makeup is incredibly diverse throughout our community. Um, We are around 70% free and reduced lunch population for the district, gives and takes depending on the point of the school year. And we're concentrated in the Indianapolis city center. So we are part of Center Township in the heart of Indiana. Um, And we are a school district who has seen uh, the community change a lot over the last 30 years in Indianapolis. So Indianapolis Public Schools was once a district that served about 100,000 students. And as suburbia really started to happen around the city center, we saw the school district kind of break up into pieces around the community. So we've seen a huge historical change in the last 30, 40, 50 years in Indianapolis. Um, But we maintain about 27,000 student population um, and serve lots of different ethnicities, races, serve many world languages in our community. 
So since sometimes when we're not at the point of delivery with students, right, we're not the ones standing in the classroom with them, uh, it can become difficult to understand, all right, how do I impact X, Y, and Z, right? So today we're talking about um, equity, we're talking about education as a civil right, we're talking a little bit about resources. So how do we um, impact that as education leaders or, or what do we do, right, to help with that message and with that mission? I think as education leaders, we have a responsibility to not lose sight of what's happening in a classroom. Some of that can just be by invitation. So I spend a lot of time working with teachers, working with school principals and visiting our school buildings. I think that helps paint the picture of the challenges that schools are facing. It's one thing for a district or an education institution or organization to see the data on paper and to do feedback surveys and elicit feedback and use it. Um, it's another to be in the thick of what's happening in an everyday school environment. And I think it helps us understand what district level or organizational level changes could help make the teaching and learning environment much more um, conducive for learning in whatever way in which we might have to do learning, especially given that COVID is still present in our school districts. So I think the thing that we end up, you know, coming down to as the adults who are serving kids either directly or kids by you know, our participation and employment in educational institutions comes down to a choice of being an active participant in a school or not. And I think for many of us, it actually looks like being a parent. So we are parents of children who are going to school and being served by somebody else for most of the school day. And to volunteer, to you know, help out for an hour in a classroom and understand the complexity of what teachers are faced with, the complexity of what principals are faced with, is what really adds the humility to this um, understanding of we've got a very complicated environment in schools. And it's been that way for a very long time. It's just polarized now because of COVID. And for us to have the humility as a parent who's just helping out for an hour during a class, or as an educator who's maybe not been in a classroom for 10 or 15 years to raise your hand and say like, hey, first grade teacher, I'd love to come read to your kids today. Or in the next couple of days, could I release you for an hour and spend the reading block with your students? It's our way of serving, but maintaining perspective on what matters most and what's what the challenges actually are. And it's the best opportunity to get feedback from educators and leaders in buildings around what's working, what's not. What do you think is an organizational problem versus a pr problem that you're just struggling with in your school? So I think it comes down to choice and responsibility as how we're showing up in a building to serve and to lead. Um, and again, for a lot of us, that can just mean being a parent. But at the end of the day, it's a choice that we end up making that gives us the perspective and keeps the very genuine um, and authentic parts of I'm here to serve and I'm here to serve and support you and the kiddos in your classroom versus I'm going to send you a Google form and you tell me what you think. Um, so I think that plays out in just the way in which teachers see us rally and support and principals rally and support for this 27,000 student organization here in Indianapolis. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, as a district leader, it's really important to get out there and be in the district, right? And not just, um, you know, in the office if you can. I, I love one of the examples that you use there because that was always when I felt like my vision was sort of getting too cloudy after a while, right? Being in too many calls or meetings or whatever, and I started to feel that disconnect. You know, I would call mm -hmm. one of my schools and say the same thing you just said, which is, can I just come and read to a group of students for a half an hour? And you know, I think that really helps kind of recenter and, and get you back into the mindset of like, okay, this is why we're here this is what we're doing. These are the education experiences that we're building for our students. Um, so in addition to like getting out there, right, when you're making these decisions, there's also just a ton of stakeholders. And so how do you then, you know, make sure that all of these stakeholders have voices that are being heard? Um, you know, when we talk about equity and this being a, education, being a civil right, we have to make sure that we're, we're getting our stakeholders involved. 
So, so how do you do that? And maybe an example of, you know, when that's worked or not worked or whatever. Man, I could give you so many examples, especially what's not worked. Um, I think as a large organization, feedback and stakeholder, authentic stakeholder engagement is something that we could kind of look at and get sweaty and concerned about because it is a lot. One of the structures that we created in our district that's helped reach the stakeholders who are outside of our school buildings, who are outside of our district office, is the institution of what we call town halls. So we have organized community opportunities for input, and those community opportunities are aligned to our district strategic plan. It's called our 2025 plan. And one of the priorities in that plan is a racial equity priority. And we outline very specific actions and projects that we as a district are working on to help solve for some of the racial equity problems that we're seeing in our school communities. And it provides an opportunity to have dialogue with parents, community leaders, um, our local pastors in Indianapolis come to the events and are bringing voice on behalf of the communities that they serve. Then we also have, you know, a feedback form type system that goes out to parents, goes out to community members, but the town halls are really powerful, especially in having the hard conversations. Um, it, because some of it, is, some of it is about context building, and some of it is about us being educated by the members of the community who want to see things done differently, but maybe don't know how, and they want to explore it with us versus us coming up with ideas that we're just bringing to say, "Do you like it? Do you not?" Um, so it really helps us build the concrete foundation before we're starting to stack the the two by fours onto our house. And I think one of the things that really helps us maintain the authenticity there is because we're actually saying we're rolling up our sleeves and we're coming, we're coming without an agenda, we're coming with a topic. And here's how, you know, we would want to make sure that we're walking away from this conversation with potential solutions that we could implement to better serve our community stakeholders, and then others who are invested in the Indianapolis public schools. Um, our school leaders can be part of that, teachers are part of that. We also have a structure that every other school district has with a school board. Um, public comment is made at school boards, but it's a very one-sided way of hearing feedback from folks, which is why we tend to lean toward the town halls. And then the other more informal ways of eliciting feedback, feedback surveys. Our schools send surveys out to their community members who are more than just the students, parents, or guardians. Um, and all that rolls into the district office and we can see what information is coming back. But I would certainly say like, there's definitely a pyramid of ways that we can elicit feedback. And I think it depends on what the objective is. If the objective is to authentically hear, we're sitting at the table literally with people. Um, if it is that we just want to do a pulse check, like, hey, do you guys like Schoology? Do you guys like Power School? That's something that we could send in a feedback survey and doesn't necessarily need to have conversation yet. Let's see what the survey results look like and then determine if we need to have some conversation. Um, but I would certainly say it's a toggling between methods to receive feedback intentionally. And it, again, depends on the objective of what we're trying to accomplish. Well, it's great to hear that you're shaping it around, you know, what's most important for, you know, at this time for this group, you know, how are we using basically the appropriate tool for the job? So Ashley, I want to thank you for coming today. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing your story and your voice here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for joining us today on Focus on K-12 EdTech and the Education Experience. If you enjoyed today's show, please feel free to like, subscribe, and click the little bell so that you get notified whenever we post a new episode. Or reach out to me on Twitter at dconopelko. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time as we focus on K-12.